Hi everyone, we are now on YouTube live. So I'm happy that you are with us. In a minute, uh, Geshima will go up and join us. Hi, Geshima. Hi, Hi. everyone. Nice to see you all here. Uh, we are now recording on the YouTube. Okay. And you are now a co-host. Oh, all right. Just a teacher. No, you, you assigned so long as co-host, not Geshima. You have to change. Ah, okay. So long as co-host. Co-host. Yeah, change now. Okay, okay. Yeah. Sorry, now it's okay. Okay, great. Thank you. Well, let's start with the motivation. So again, focus on the breath. Focus on your breathing in and out for a few seconds. And then to remind us of the possibilities, our own potential. Visualize in the space in front of you, Buddha Shakyamuni. Who's the same nature as our Lama or our Lamas, as well as all other enlightened beings. seated on a lotus, a sun disk, and a moon disk. Dressed in the saffron-colored robes of a monk. And compassionately gazing at us and at all other sentient beings who are surrounding us. And for whose benefit we are here today. And based on the simple fact that we all want to be free from suffering and want to be happy and satisfied, let's generate affectionate love which is a type of affection that find sentient beings lovable, deserving to be loved.
while aware that all their shortcomings are not in the nature of their mind. And then pay attention to their dukkha, their dissatisfactory experiences in the form of the suffering of suffering, but also in the form of just having a mind and a body that are affected by ignorance and all other afflictions. and generate deep affection that not only wishes them to be free from these forms of dukkha or suffering, but also wishes to help them overcome all these states together with their causes. And then allow that great compassion you've just generated to strengthen, to deepen and to give way to the special altruistic attitude that is determined to do whatever is necessary and however long it may take to help sentient beings overcome all their dukkha, all their dissatisfactory aggregates, experiences and so forth. Together with their causes. And since that's realistically only possible once we become fully enlightened, let's generate the mind of enlightenment that aspires or is even determined to attain the fully enlightened state of a Buddha for the benefit of each and every sentient being based on great love and great compassion. And it's with this motivation that we continue to study the text of online training, but also recite the prayer. Prayer of taking refuge and generating bodhicitta. I go for refuge until I'm enlightened to the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Supreme Assembly. By the accumulation of merits, of practicing generosity and so forth, may I become a Buddha to benefit all sentient beings. I go for refuge until I'm enlightened to the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Supreme Assembly. By the accumulation of merits, of practicing generosity and so forth, may I become a Buddha to benefit all sentient beings. I go for refuge until I'm enlightened to the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Supreme Assembly. By the accumulation of merits, of practicing generosity and so forth, may I become a Buddha to benefit all sentient beings. 
All right, thank you. Okay, we've got a question, but before I start, I have one announcement. Uh, the announcement is about how to continue with this class. Uh, I was thinking to finish this text and we'll finish it, well, today, next time, maybe one more class. It just depends. Uh, can't really say exactly how much longer it will take, but I thought to continue or to go back to a to a text that concerns more the philosophical aspects, but without letting go, of course, of bodhicitta, um, compassion, and so forth. So to not focus merely on emptiness, and someone made this comment that they also thought that wasn't a good idea, but even besides that comment, well, first of all, I don't have the time to prepare the text on the fundamental wisdom. I mentioned that earlier, or last week or before or a few weeks ago um but also i think it's important to continue to study bodhicitta as i just said and compassion but combine it with emptiness and so i decided to study another text by nagarjuna which has been translated into english so it won't be a problem um there's a commentary i'll follow so the text i would like to teach is nagarjuna's uh precious garland so it's got different chapters on different topics. It does talk about emptiness and selfness and so forth. So it gives us the opportunity to also go into these important topics. But it doesn't just talk about, I mean, uh, just a few verses that it goes into it, explains them. And then there are other topics, just how to live our daily life. I mean, there's a lot of lojung in there. And it's such an important text. It has been taught by His Holiness the Dalai Lama several times uh, that's a text yeah I would really like to start once we finish with this text and considering the situation in Israel for instance I still well it still addresses uh, our reactions to situations and so forth it, it's basically how to deal with life on a daily basis but including philosophical topics that go a little bit more into details on emptiness, on impermanence, and so forth. So there's a commentary by Geltsopji I'm going to follow. And there are three translations, actually. There's Jeffrey Hopkins, and then there are two by someone called John Dunn. And it it's pretty easy, I guess, to just show them on the screen. Of course, you could uh, buy them if you wanted to. But we could just, because they're not all the same, they're not exactly the same, but we may look at all of them and then discuss the different verses. And uh, it gives you a, a, a good sense of, well, the whole of Buddhism. It addresses all topics to a certain degree. So I hope that's okay um, once we're done. So, of course, if you have any other suggestions, you're welcome to, to voice them, to maybe send me an email or send me a message or even talk right now. Another text I was thinking was Ayadeo's 400 verses, but I think for now uh, it's a good idea to go through to study the um, Precious Garland by Nagarjuna. All right. Okay. Um, and then there's a question by Shmuel. So Bodhicitta is the wish to become enlightened for the benefit of all sentient beings. Does this include for our own benefit as well? If it does not, this contradicts the fact that many benefits of bodhicitta are listed, which are given for our own sake. Yes, absolutely. It does include our own benefit. Definitely does. It's not just for the benefit of all sentient beings, but it's also for our own sake. If it does include our own benefit, he argues, um, and we should become enlightened for our own sake, not just personal liberation for our own sake, then this contradicts the idea that the fundamental vehicle is sufficient for our own benefit. Well, but that doesn't exclude sentient beings. I mean, just because it's for our own sake doesn't mean it's not also for the benefit of all sentient beings. It's equally for our own sake and all sentient beings. Now, actually, strictly speaking, of the two, um, liberation and full enlightenment, even there, 
even of those two, for our own sake, it's still better to become enlightened. I mean, to free our mind from all faults, from all um, obscurations, since we have the potential to reach such a state. I mean, really to actualize our fullest potential, it makes perfectly sense to become enlightened, but to also do it for the benefit of all sentient beings. Then the question, of course, may arise, why are sentient beings mentioned so much more? What, why is there not more of an emphasis on our own benefit? Well, because we're really good at it, <laughs> to look after our own benefit. It, it doesn't need to be stressed as much. So I guess it's also to bring back that balance. I mean, right now, a bodhisattva is someone who's who's found this balance. Bodhisattva's own benefit and the benefit of sentient beings. But we've fallen into the the extreme of just looking after our own benefit. Which is why to counteract that that kind of extreme, the benefit is much more on sentient beings. But actually, if we think about it, what is more important, our own benefit or the benefit of sentient beings? Well, logically, it wouldn't make sense to say it's other sentient beings. Why? Because from the perspective of another person, it would be the same. All sentient beings would be more important. But from their perspective, then we would be more important than them and everyone else. So if we take it from the perspective of all sentient beings, if it's for every sentient being who generates body, or who, well, f f f yeah, who, who practices bodhicitta, for instance, or generates bodhicitta, if all other sentient beings would always be more important, well, then sentient beings would all be equally important again, for the reason I just gave, because for everyone, uh, if, if we take it from the perspective of every sentient being generating bodhicitta. I hope that's not too confusing. But anyway, so this was not Shmuel's question, the part about who's more important, ourselves or other sentient beings, but I thought to just add it. Anyway, so others and ourselves were equally important, and it's done for the benefit of all sentient beings. And maybe what is mentioned less, but the, the thing is, for the reason I just gave, but the thing is, it's based very much on also love and compassion for ourselves. So love and compassion for other sentient beings, it's not just the wish to become enlightened, thinking, oh, for the benefit of others, kind of just without really giving it much thought. When we say for the benefit of others, then that means we have this incredible care and affection and love and compassion for sentient beings. And that's why we want to become enlightened. But we also have it for ourselves. So that's that's included, that's indicated by the fact that we have it for all other sentient beings. It's just not stressed as much. Okay, so I hope that answers this question. Great. All right, then let's look at, uh, I don't have the, uh, the lamb room here right now. Oh, by the way, when we studied Nakajuna's text, we'll continue with the same format. The format will remain the same with starting with the Lam Rim, going through it as we do do it right now and going through the different topics, um, introducing them, giving you the chance to meditate on them at home. And then, uh, of course, spend time discussing the text, meditating on it. So the format won't change, only the text will be different. Okay, so we'll still discuss generosity as part of the Lam Rim, part of studying the Lam Rim. It's still generosity. So generosity, we've had last time, there are three types of generosity. Uh, generosity with regard to material objects, generosity with regard to giving fearlessness, and generosity with regard to teaching the Dharma, or generosity with the Dharma. So being generous with material objects, being generous with providing fearlessness, providing help, basically, and when when other people suffer, when they have problems, and generosity with the Dharma. The most important is the third type, generosity with the Dharma, and it doesn't matter whether someone is ordained, a monk or a nun, as, because anyone, anyone can practice the Dharma, and I, I mean, I know so many lay people when I meet them, I'm thinking, oh, they're much better practitioners than I could ever be in this lifetime. So it's got nothing to do with um, with being ordained or not. Anyone can practice the Dharma, and therefore anyone can be generous with the Dharma, generous by way of sharing their knowledge, but also generous by being a good example, 
being who they are based on their mind training and in that way inspiring others to possibly practice in the same way. But anyway, talking about these three types of generosity, when it comes to generosity with material goods, for instance, well, usually it's not encouraged from monks and nuns because they're not supposed to have a lot of uh, possessions that they can give away. Or if they give them away, it shouldn't be in, in such a way that they, I don't know, can no longer feed themselves and so forth. Um, but the thing is that, yes, it, it, but that it shouldn't be discouraged. And I'm thinking also about people who don't have much, who possibly have to feed their children and so forth. Again, generosity should be done with wisdom, should be done uh, with the right kind of uh, measure. Okay. But anyway, what I want to talk about today in particular is how to give how do we actually give? So what, what does it mean to when we say to give, but how should we do it? One thing that comes to mind and that is considered to be really important is with respect and gratitude. So we usually expect gratitude from the other person when we give something, but it should be the other way around that we should be grateful to them. And I, I, I know some people who've actually, when they've given me something, they thank me for giving for giving them the opportunity to. And I was like, what? No, no, I should thank you. Don't thank me. But it was it was totally sincere. This person really felt that I was giving them the opportunity. And I, I thought it was really beautiful. And so, yeah, that's exactly uh, um, how it should be practice um, seeing the other person as kind in that sense of giving the opportunity but also giving with respect now I don't know if you've been to India then I guess you know a little more of what, what that may entail because sometimes you know when you're in India and there's a person begging for something and that can be really pushy and the moment you give them something to them they turn around no longer know you you know there's no like sometimes of course they say thank you but sometimes they don't and that's such a great opportunity to give with respect i mean like you, you look at them they may look dirty their clothes are are torn they they don't look like they have ever received any education and maybe even if they have you know it, it seems like you, i mean we don't know but in some cases you may feel oh they don't, just don't want to work we don't know so the point is that this is such a good opportunity to, to give with respect and gratitude. Okay. And to also, when we give, not to make the other person wait for a long time. So this is what the Lumbrum teachings, for instance, stress. We shouldn't uh, delay giving to someone. If we can give now, we should do it right away. We should also not expect something back or even um, ask for something back. So to ask the other person to do things for us. Sometimes it may happen that we give something and have certain expectations. So forget about gratitude, but really expecting something back. Um, of course, also not, we should not do anything that is that makes the other person go against the Dharma. I mean, obviously, uh, we shouldn't we shouldn't promise to give a certain amount and then reduce that amount. I mean, even if mentally, We've made up our mind, I'm going to give this much, I'm going to do such and such. We shouldn't reduce it, which reminds me of a, a story one of my classmates once told me. It's really funny, actually. I laughed, I laughed about it, but it's, it's kind of not, it's not really that funny. But he told me about um, some relatives when they came from Tibet to see his holiness. They had this opportunity, this lifetime opportunity to see his holiness. And they were so excited and everything. So they stood there in line. And the husband took out, I don't know, I forget what it was, maybe a thousand rupees, wanted to offer his holiness. I mean, it's a holy being, a, a special being. It's it's a great opportunity. And his wife was like, no, that's too much. Don't give him that much. That's too much. <laughs> it's like, no, don't do that. <laughs> right? And so my classmate told me we laughed about it. It was really funny. I mean, the difference is not that big and in the end they ended up giving less but um yeah so the 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 point being 
um, if you have in mind, you want to give that much, do not change your mind. Just give that amount because the, the virtue will be reduced by that much. Of course, if in the end you made a huge mistake and, you know, there are certain reasons, of course, that's different. But if it's stinginess kind of takes over, no. Um, also, we should not keep an account of how much we've given to someone. You just give it and forget it. Not like, oh, I gave them a hundred rupees. Ooh, should I give them three now? Like, don't, don't keep an account of what you've given to someone. Also, we shouldn't give like little by little. I mean, before I talked about reduce, like, like delaying generosity. Here I'm talking about just giving a little bit at a time. No, if we can give, just give the whole thing. Um, of course, what we give shouldn't harm someone. And um, what's also important is to to perform the action ourselves, to not uh, do it through another person. It's more virtuous, unless you want to benefit that person. So sometimes I see little children, and I don't think they're doing it for that reason. When they ask, like when when you see people begging, like in the streets here in Germany, for instance, or there are people, yeah, like playing music and so forth, and they ask for some some donation. Parents um, send their children. I mean, oftentimes the children want to give something, so the parents send the children. And I always think, oh, that's beautiful. They're giving their children the opportunity. Well, first of all, to be be to to familiarize with with generosity but also to get the virtue right because in that moment that person gets the virtue because of um, giving something even though it's not your own, their own but it was given to them and there's some virtue in that so in general if that's not the case it's good to give it oneself um yeah so these are some of the the guidelines if you like so to to be aware, and I think one of the most important parts, one of the most important aspects is really giving with compassion and love if we can. That's best. Bodhicitta, of course, no need to mention it. But if we can't do that in a specific moment, with respect. Every time you give with respect. And especially when you give to a beggar, it's already the position we're in because they're usually sitting down. And so you're kind of looking down on them and just, no, always keep respect. I remember one of my teachers, Gesh Tupdin Pesang, he used to always say, give with respect, give with respect. So it's like he said it so many times. Like if I walk up to, when I walk up to a beggar, it's like, do I have a respect for mind or not? Because he, he emphasized it so much. And it's really beautiful. So almost like also when you give, not to, like, to drop it down from above, but yeah, to do it in, in, in a way Geshe-la suggested. So these are just some guidelines and we can practice this by way of doing our meditation on this, practice giving by visualizing it, but going through these points that I just did to check, am I doing this? Am I doing, it? can I do this? Is this possible? And to just visualize it. Because, well, our brain doesn't know we're actually doing it or not. And it leaves some imprints, may, creates new pathways, and helps us to familiarize with more giving. Oh, someone raised their hand. Dalit, you raised your hand? Yes, I just want to ask you, because you said that uh, if you have something, so don't uh, give it uh, a little by little, uh, give it all. So... I just want to understand it more because, for example, if my cousin say I want to help him, I prefer to do it uh, by months and not to give him all at once. So what did you mean? But like, uh, that's true. Well, I mean, it's. I think it's always the motivation. It's always the motivation. If it's like, oh, I can't give that much. I'll, I'll give a little. You know, if it is, if it's out of stinginess, it would be much better for them if it was given. I don't know if your cousin wants to buy a car and they're waiting now for twenty four months because every day, you know, if it was like that. But in 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 the case here, you mentioned, I mean, it makes sense to if you can give only a little bit every month, and it's they don't they need this much, and this this is good for them. Then of course, by all means. It all has to do with like our motivation, right? Like some people it's like, oh, can't give that much. It's like, I, I don't want to give. I mean, it would actually benefit the other person only then in that case. All right. Anyway, um, all right. 
having said this, so let's go back to the text. Okay. Um, I'll, last time we, sp yeah, we got... You had to share with us because I stopped the sharing. Oh, oh, yes, 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 yes. Sorry, just a sec. Okay, let me just... Back. Yep. Okay. Can you see now? Can you see the the text? Yes. Can you do it bigger, please, on all, on more screen? Yes. I'll try. How about this? Is it clear enough? Yeah, it's better. Thanks. It's better. Now, I, I think I can go bigger than this, but you can see, right? It's good. Can I go bigger? Uh, anyway, I hope it's clear for everyone. And um, I just wanted to, to go to continue with where we got from, from where we got last time. So I think it's presentation of a lifetime's practice in summary. I'll just quickly go through the last points because we had this long break. So we got to the presentation of a lifetime's practice in summary. So in brief, uh, Geshe Chagoba says, in brief, the essence of instruction is this, apply yourself to the five powers. So as you remember, you have the power of what's called um, propelling intention. This propelling intention. It's I, I mentioned that before. It's a really important word in Tibetan. It's more than just an intention. It's this impetus. It's this, mm, it's this kind of, you set your mind with a forcefulness that propels you to to actually be able to do such. So I gave you the example, uh, for instance, in, at night when you fall asleep, when you go to sleep, in your mind you set your alarm clock, so your inner clock. I'm gonna get up tomorrow morning, no matter what. I'll definitely get up. So in that way, it helps our mind, and this is it's kind of like it's just a strong aspiration, and it's how our mind works. The whole reason for aspiration for prayers, in a sense, or the main reason for prayers, for instance, is to set our mind um, onto a certain goal. Of course, with a prayer, we're also requesting the assistance of other beings. Just as in everyday life, we may ask the assistance of a, a doctor when we are receiving, when we're having some some physical issues. Now, in the case of prayers, we're praying to Buddhas, Bodhisattvas, Dharma protectors, and so forth, who we can communicate with or who who, who are aware of our of our prayers. But at the same time, we're also setting our own mind. Kind of, it's an aspiration. I want to do this. I want to do this in the future. And this is how our mind works. It's it's. I shouldn't say crazy, it's fascinating. It's not crazy, but it's fascinating how our mind, how psychologically, this is how our mind works. We set our mind again and again. We're creating the causes for our mind to change, to transform in such a way that this becomes possible. That's why we are continuously aspiring to become enlightened. The more we do it, the more our mind, or the more we create the causes and conditions for our mind to well, generate bodhicitta, actual, I mean, not just bodhicitta the way we generate it right now, but true bodhicitta that arises naturally or spontaneously, and the more we're likely to actually enter the path, etc. So it's all to do with aspiration. And here it talks about this propelling intention, Pemba Dhamma, which is just more forceful. So it's like this, this determination, it's like a, a propelling intention of being determined to give our very best, not to be controlled by our self-centeredness. I give my very best. If we do this all the time, then when self-centeredness arises, it holds us back. We remember, oh, wait a minute. Okay, I'm determined. No way. I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna follow. Follow it. I mean, I'm not gonna let it run wild as I usually do. So that's one power, very important power. Then the power of familiarity, of course, again, to familiarize with this by again and again setting our propelling intent, intention the way I just described. The power of the wholesome seed, so to accumulate virtue. Any opportunity we see can be tiny, it, can be, it may seem really insignificant, but this wholesome seed, the white seed or wholesome seed here, supports our intention. It supports everything we do. It's like 
I don't know, it's like the capital we have in the bank that supports our business. So here it's the capital of virtuous actions. So any opportunity to not uh, ignore it. The power of remorse, of course. I mean, I mean, I mean, let's face it, our mind is controlled right now by the afflictions. Maybe less than in the past, but it still is. And then if we have just sincere regret, remorse, not feeling guilty and all that, that's extreme. No, just feeling, okay, that wasn't okay. Next time, I should try harder. I'm sorry for what I did. I'll try harder. And then, of course, the power of supplication, the power of aspiration in the sense of also um, aspiring, asking for assistance. So here, prayer in the sense of or supplication, um, not just to set our own mind, but also to ask for the assistance of other beings. All right. So that's um, what well, these are the five powers. We should apply these. And then, of course, at the time of death, as, as Mahayana's transference method, the five powers are also very important. So when we think of poor, everyone is very much, or everyone not, but those who know about poor, poor I'm really interested in poor. But here, poor are these practices. They're said to be more powerful than uh, the poor performed by another person because it's through our own qualities. So as I said before, the power here of the wholesome seed, that's the first one mentioned, to offer our possessions to the Dharma. Now, we may, of course, give some to our relatives and so forth, but especially if it creates negative karma, greed and so forth, it may give rise. I mean, it's not the first time that someone inherits something and they're great, I don't know, there are court cases between family members because of feeling they didn't get enough and so forth. So in order to avoid that, uh, if, if that's a danger, definitely to give everything away to charity, possibly to the Dharma, to support others to practice. Um, but at least some, so to, to avoid this kind of problem. The power of propelling intention means that we do not that at the time of death, our mind is set. I'm not going to create attachment to my body. That's it. Body and mind, the time has come to separate, to, to let go of this body, to let go of our possessions of this lifetime. So the power of the propelling intention, where you're totally determined, I'm not going to let this hold me back. I'm just ready to move on. The power of remorse, of course, to also take a moment I made mistakes. I'm sorry for those. And a lot of people do this, even not in the context of the Dharma, that they confess having done certain things at the time of death. And that is really important because there's nothing that holds you back besides the attachment. But also, okay, maybe confessing it in person if you made a mistake, maybe apologizing if you've got the opportunity. But at the very least, okay, I'm sorry for that. Just one last time, generate remorse in this existence, um, which is a powerful, of course, antidote to any kind of afflictions or any, sorry, any kind of negative action. Um, the power of aspiration to pray to not be separated from the enlightened mind, from the mind of enlightenment and the power of familiarity to practice as we're dying to continuously practice uh, bodhicitta. All right. So these are the measurements. These are the presentations of a lifetime's practice, including the five powers while you're alive and the five powers while you're dying. And then, of course, the intent of all teachings converges on a single point. Um, just to remind us, well, it's the grasping at inherent existence and the resulting self-centeredness that we really need to look out for. Previously, I said that last time I said, well, it's self-centeredness, like when problems arise, we need to remember that. But that doesn't mean that there are no problems from the outside and that we shouldn't do something about the external situation. Of course we should. But being so upset and 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 sometimes full of hatred and full of frustration and anger, which is just which just really harms ourselves. Um no one else. It's like the Buddha himself said, like having all this anger and, and frustration, it's like holding a burning ember, like a, holding a burning piece of 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 coal, for instance, and um, with the intention to throw it at the other person. But as you're holding it, it, it just totally burns you. So therefore, 
or as the saying goes, I don't think it's from the Buddha, but it's a beautiful saying, being angry or being full of hatred is like eating poison and, and expecting the object of our anger, the object of our hatred to die. It's not, not going to happen. So, therefore, of course, to be to apply wisdom, to apply um, common sense, understanding, and do something against the injustices that are may be responsible for the situation, but at the same time, also be aware that whatever we experience, and my experience is not exactly the same as everyone else's, for sure. So based on that, it becomes clear that it is a reflection of my mind. It is a result of karmic actions accumulated. So therefore, it's and in that way, it's also a result of my own self-centeredness, my own self grasping which makes it just so much easier it takes away some of this heaviness of like being caught in the circumstances of this world and everyone else's mistakes no there's something we can contribute we have contributed uh, and in that way to remember it all converges on a single point we have to work on self-grasping and self-centeredness so dharma practice is meaningless meaningless unless it functions as an antidote to self-centeredness. Forget it. If, if it increases, don't practice the Dharma. As a result of, of, of practicing the Dharma, if your self-centeredness increases, the Dharma is not the right not the right system or the right, uh, I'm talking about the Buddha Dharma, it's not the right kind of Dharma, not the right kind of teaching for you. And it said that the Dharma is the, it acts as such an antidote. It's an antidote because based on that, the, the if we do real Dharma practice, then if we look back, our self-centeredness should be reduced. Self-grasping, um, it's really just reduced once we realize emptiness directly. That's when we totally eliminate it. But it can be, it's it's power over us, it's it's strength over us. That can definitely be reduced. And self-centeredness, I mean, again, once we realize emptiness directly, then we can start to remove at least the coarser levels of self-centeredness, but we can weaken it at the very least and be sure that it doesn't arise as frequently or at least not as strongly as it usually does. So that's important, most important part of uh, mind training, of, of Dharma practice. Of the two witnesses, uphold the principal one. So of course, to meet other people's to, to not meet other people's disapproval. So for other people to um, possibly see us as a good practitioner and so forth is some kind of testimony. So it's a, it's a good thing, but that's not enough because other people, unless they can read our mind, unless they have special uh, clairvoyant type of qualities, they're just observing a, a fraction. They're just seeing a fraction of our own behavior. No way do they fully understand us. And so we are our own best witness. So mindfulness, introspection, so important. So important to be mindful, uh, attentive, and introspective. What am I thinking? What am I doing in my interaction with another person? Usually when we're just on our own, we're daydreaming, it's not as bad, but with other people. Afflictions usually arise with other people. And so to be in to, to apply introspection and so forth and be your best witness. What am I doing? What is going on? Where can I improve? Right? And especially with the people we have a hard time with. Because unless we deal with the problems we have with these other people, with these particular people, it's very difficult to move on. So these we need to focus on. People, sometimes they're the closest to us. They may be family members, sometimes siblings. Something that goes back like a long time when we were very little. And some of the emotions that are um, connected to that are very deep. They're very deeply, deeply ingrained. And so, okay, we, we may have to be skillful and we may not be able to 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 really address it right away but sooner or later we need to because they we are we are we're not truly free i mean if this affliction continues like this i don't know anger and resentment it's important to look at it to maybe find a, a therapist i mean maybe we're not able to do it on our own but with this gentleness and openness with the help possibly of a therapist to look at it because it's it's harming us 
So therefore, to be a, a witness in such a way that we have enough introspection, honesty, and courage to face our own demon. I think sometimes it requires a lot of courage, of course. But, I mean, there are two choices, to ignore it and be miserable or to deal with it. I mean, which one is it, right? It's a bit like we have, we, we, we'd like to have our house really clean. We throw everything in one room and just all the dirt comes in there. Well, it's, it's not going to be a solution, really. We may just lock the door to forget about it. But, well, it's not a long-term solution. Anyway, so to be a true witness to our own strength, but also our weaknesses. Okay. And then cultivate constantly uh, the, the, the joyful mind alone. That's a little difficult. I mean, it's like saying, don't sweat. Don't be cold. <laughs> it's almost like, how can you just be joyful on command? But it's not saying that. It's not saying just suppress everything and, and be joyful. That's not what it means. Uh, it would rather means that, especially in the beginning, we we need to learn to use difficulties. So utilize them instead of allowing ourselves to be thrown off our feet. Oh, just another problem. Oh my God, my life sucks. Instead, to habituate, to familiarize ourselves to a kind of attitude that when problems arise, oh, there's a challenge. Hmm, there's a challenge. There's something life is teaching me a lesson or whatever, whichever way you want to look at it. This is a great opportunity for mind training because this, this is when mind training is, is truly, it's truly difficult, but also truly meaningful because when everything goes well, we just get whatever we want. It's easy, right? It's, it's, it's really easy. I think it's, it's, it reminds me of something that Jetsuma, um, Denzel Palmer once taught me, uh, once, once said, uh, I saw it on a t shirt actually. <laughs> a student once wore a t shirt, it said Jetsuma Denzel Palmer. And she said, to truly form a piece of wood, you need sandpaper. You need some rough measures to smoothen, oh, to smoothen a piece of wood. So it's you, you can't take a, a cotton piece of cotton wool. I mean, you're going to take forever to smoothen that piece of wood. So the piece of wood is like our mind. And the cotton wood, cotton wool are like pleasant experiences and sandpaper are the rough experience, are the difficulties we face. So to really transform our mind, it sometimes needs sandpaper. It's good to have these difficulties because they're, they're a challenge. They show us where we still have to work on, where our weaknesses are. They help us to get stronger, to get more love and compassion for others, develop better understanding of what others go through because we can truly put ourselves into the shoes of the other person. Negative karma is finished. I mean, it, it's it's exhausted by way of, um, what's the word, by, by, by ripening in the form of certain experiences. So really, it is a good reason to be joyful if you think about it that way, right? If you look at it from that perspective, reason to be joyful it's like nowadays a lot of people say oh corona was actually quite good <laughs> it's really funny how nowadays people see oh it also had some no they don't say it was all good but they say it also had some good aspects so people now agree to look at it from a positive uh side so all the there were some definitely uh some benefits as a result of that, we can have Zoom classes now. Before Corona, like we couldn't have those kind of classes. So, as one, to give you one example. But the point here being, to look at it uh, by applying positive psychology, by looking at it from a positive point of view, and utilize it. And actually, through the force of training our mind, well, we can gain confidence that we will be able to integrate any adversity into our practice. So it's like if you do it once, you do it twice, you gain the self-confidence that, that no matter what, you're ready to face it. And it also makes us really resilient that, yeah, we may be, be thrown off our feet for a few seconds, but then you get up again and you keep trying, right? You get up and you try it again. In this way, we become much more resilient. So mind training is definitely a great way to... Um, utilize adversity into the path and to become more resilient. 
Okay. So therefore, a joyful mind arises as a, as a consequence of that. So it's not like saying, just be happy, just be joyful. You can't force that. But find that joy within yourself. Look for that joy within yourself, where no matter what, there's a deep sense of meaning and a sense of it'll be all right. It's impermanent. It's going to change. And I'm going to use it as long as it's there. I'm going to make the best of it to, to cultivate my own mind, to transform my own mind, to train my own mind. And that naturally gives us a sense of meaning and joy or at least peace of mind. It's, it's, it's deep within, but it's important to discover that. And of course, a sign of the trained mind is having the five greatnesses. And then it goes on to say, if these can be upheld even when distracted, you're trained. So this doesn't just include the five greatnesses, but of everything else so far. So if we can really do that, um, I'm going to go through the five greatnesses in a moment. But if we can do this, we become like a skilled rider. You know, like a person who rides a horse. Here, the, the, the rider is our mind and the horse is life. Or, well, yeah, I guess, yeah, I guess you could say the, it's life, you know? Like sometimes the, the, there are rough bits and the horse may move this way and that way. And other times it's very smooth. And sometimes the, the horse runs faster or slower or it may, I don't know, suddenly stop. And a skilled rider remains on the horse remains does not fall off yeah so even when distracted even when we are distracted so what are these five in particular the five greatnesses and the, i mentioned those before that to a certain degree we can all practice them so the characteristic of a great ascetic who can endure any suffering so to become more and more as it, as we practice more and more able to endure suffering all right, we get sick. Okay, endure the pain without falling into deep depression. Things go wrong with our family, with our children, and there always will be. Again, to to be able to bear that suffering, um, to to endure it and to deal with it, the way I described earlier. The characteristic of a great hero, as it says, is who cherishes others. So to learn to cherish others more. The characteristic of a great practitioner or a great practitioner of virtue who does not act in contradiction to the Dharma. And again, sure, there's room for improvement. Can we do more to not act? Think of situations throughout our day, whatever. Uh, again, there's definitely something we could do. The characteristic of a great disciplined mind who avoids even the subtlest misbehavior. All right. Again, let's go deeper to our negative actions and then the characteristic of a great yogi who practices the path to enlightenment now these are these five greatnesses but even just 0.01 percent if we practice that uh, we're definitely making our life meaningful and bring ourselves and others more peace and happiness all right anyway then there are the the commitments of mind training we should always constant we should always train in the three general points so what are these three points well to adhere to the different precepts the different vows the different rules that are part of buddhist practice that's very important so as much as we can in terms of ethical conduct to follow that the second is to avoid any form of kind of reckless behavior we shouldn't be reckless um to push ourselves too hard. I guess that's also part of it. To push too hard, to do too much. Um, not We should, of course, not engage in any dangerous behavior for the sake of the Dharma, for instance. I don't know, to go off into some area that may be really quiet, but potentially dangerous. You could be robbed or raped or whatever. And so, again, to not be reckless in that sense or to demonstrate you have no self-cherishing and do something crazy. Anyway, to be, to be, to use common sense, to not harm yourself and, of course, not harm others. So that's, again, that's the second point, not to be reckless. And then also to avoid any form of partiality, bias, partiality, um, to, to, I don't know, if, if someone harms us, 
to bear the harm of some people, but not to bear the harm of others. I mean, to bear harm in the sense of not getting angry is really important. But we also have to react in order for that person not to harm us. So to also say enough is enough and to do this equally without partiality. To be respectful towards everyone, no matter who they are, whether they're pissed us off or not, whether they're rich or poor and so forth. So partiality, impartiality, sorry, by non being non-biased, also very important. And again, to check where am I biased? We sometimes may think, oh, I'm a really unbiased person. And then we catch ourselves in certain situations being biased. So it's all part of mindfulness, part of introspection to observe. All right. So I'm sure there's always there's something we find in those. And once you understand them, of course, the point is to go over them time and again and to check or which one applies to me? Which one is it right now? Maybe all of them, maybe some of them, just maybe at different times, different points. But that's the beauty of it. We'll find something where we go, oh, oh, this is interesting. This I need to look in deeper. This is something I can uh, practice further. Transform your attitudes, but remain natural. We talked about this before, of course. Don't pretend to be like this Dharma practitioner, to be this and that. And don't need to talk about the Dharma. Just practice it. Be quiet about it. It doesn't, it shouldn't, it doesn't necessarily have to be. I mean, there should be few outwards indication that we practice the Dharma. Of course, that our behavior changes. That's of course something. It's, that's great if people notice it and it inspires others as well. I mean, they feel more comfortable in our in our presence and possibly want to do the same and in that way find a medicine to their problems, but um, not to show off or, or, yeah, in any way make it obvious to others that you practice the Dharma. Do not reflect on other shortcomings. Of course, we should think about them in the sense, maybe even to learn from them, learn from the mistakes of others. I mean, learn from our own mistakes and those of others, but not obsess about others' uh, shortcomings. I mean, we have a tendency right away to see shortcomings in others. We have this impure perception in the first place. And then our mind, you know, instead of thinking of our own misperception of our own shortcomings we'd, we'd, we'd rather like to think of others feel so much better and so to be sure that we well focus also on the positive aspects and the negative ones not with a sense of judgment but rather with understanding and compassion okay then whichever affliction is, oh, which one is, oh, do not reflect on others' shortcomings, do not speak of the defects of others, oh, I forgot to say that, uh, do not speak of the defects of others, so of course to slander and so forth, just, just discussing them with, compa with compassion and wisdom, that's different, of course. Do not reflect on other shortcomings. Yeah, not obsessing over them. Whichever affliction is the strongest, purify it fast. So whichever affliction you feel you need to deal with Deal with it. That's it, right? Oh, I know. In my case, which one is the strongest? So uh, it's just a matter of finally dealing with it. And of course, it changes. And sometimes this becomes stronger, and another one uh, maybe not as strong in comparison. Anyway, we need to address those. Just got all expectations of reward. So to always, oh, if I get something, if I get this back, not always checking, not always wanting something back because so that's self-centeredness. It comes out of self-centeredness. Of course, to be able to progress on the path, that's different, but not out of the self-centeredness. Discard poisonous food. Well, this poisonous food, of course, is any kind of action motivated by self-centeredness, any kind of action. And here, of course, the different degrees of self-centeredness, but to avoid clinging as much as we can uh, avoid strong self-centeredness, which is like food that's laced with poison. So especially when it comes to mind training, to watch is how much is our ego involved? Because that's like nutritious food laced with poison. That would be like making our mind, making our Dharma practice, turning that into something negative. Um, do not main maintain uh, inappropriate loyalty, like holding a grudge. Not being able to let go, we spoke about that, um, how it actually harms us. Um, 
no property. Do not torment with malicious banter. Okay. So to not, even in the form of teasing, to hurt someone by way of teasing them. So we sometimes do that. We may even laugh at another person or love about the malicious teasing by another person. And it hurts other people like this mocking, the sarcastic kind of sharp tongue uh, to be really careful not to hurt other people's um, feelings. If it's like a nice, like a, a, a good natured joke, that's different to make everyone laugh. Why not? Right. But I also spoke about laughing about learning to laugh about our own way our own mistakes but not in a self-deprecating way oh i'm so terrible i'm so no 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 but just being able to see the the funny aspects of our afflictions and our self-centeredness and be able to share it you know with others to be open about it being honest about it you know make other people laugh about it but in a in a good natured way so um we've heard previously how this is psychologically actually can be very helpful then do not lie in ambush in ambush which means we should not harbor vengeance we should not dwell on something that was done to us and wait for an opportunity to retaliate oh that is so nasty that one that was really nasty like you want to give a, it's like you're holding back you're holding this resentment again it's like constantly eating this poison and then the worst is ingesting even more by retaliating. So again, um, yeah. So we spoke about the, the 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 shortcomings of holding a grudge, but of course, then to retaliate, it never takes care of the situation. It just makes things worse. Don't strike at the heart. Okay. So of course, sometimes we dislike people and we don't like certain people, and we try to avoid them, and that's fine. But to hurt someone by exposing their weak points. So to really hit people where it hurts them. When we know these are their weaknesses and to expose them maybe in front of other people or just, oh, that's just, that's so nasty. And and yeah, it doesn't help our, our friendship. It doesn't help our relationship with that person. Um, unless, of course, we can help them in a compassionate way to help them gently but that's different here this is lying what is it uh the striking at the heart would be to really hurt them then it says do not place oh there's something that comes to mind you know when shantideva says uh may all the nuns stop hurting it may they may the nuns stop squ like I don't know, arguing and so forth. I thought about this for a long time. I was like, why? The monks, they also squabble. The monks also have problems. So, you know, I mean, I studied with monks. I know I've, I've seen a monk with a bleeding nose running <laughs> through the hallway because this other monk just hit him on the nose. Oh, this guy annoyed me so much. <laughs> hit him on the nose. But, you know, there's one difference between the monks and the nuns. I find the nuns are emotionally very intelligent more intelligent possibly than the monks on an emotional level they know exactly like this is just something women have i think women have this emotional intelligence i'm not saying every woman has and and no man is emotional no 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 i'm thinking in general so when there's a problem between the monks the big they, they, it sometimes becomes physical i mean it's it's a quick thing and but i don't think they they have this emotional perception of like oh they they have a certain uh, sense, but not to the same degree. I mean, if I sometimes talk about um, with with some of the nuns, emotionally they're definitely more perceptive in general. I'm saying in general, and so that is a powerful weapon. Therefore, if you want to hurt someone, you can emotionally hurt them, and that may be just more painful. I don't know whether that's one reason that instead of like becoming physical there's more this kind of like hitting at a, a, at an emotional level and in that way it be, can it can fester for longer you know and those heals quickly but the this emotional hurt may be not i'm just thinking about this so um because i have been witnessed and it's very rare but i have witnessed it when a nun can be really hurtful i mean it's 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 only been on a very few occasions but i've never seen the monks do that because i don't think they 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 
they had also that perception of what was going on with that person. Of course, not in all cases. But anyway, I'm just putting it out there. I may be totally wrong about it. Anyway, okay, so I'm saying this is why Shantideva possibly said it in terms of, yeah, conflict, uh, the ways to, to deal in a conflict for a woman and a man. There may be some difference. Anyway, um, in the positive and negative, negative ways. Well, I mean, I'm just talking about the negative part. Then do not place the load of the zo onto an ox. A zo is a huge animal. I think it's a, it's a, it's a, Oh, it's an, uh, a mixture between a yak and an ox. So they, they, they. Um, it's, it's like a mule, like a mule when you have a horse and a and a donkey. When they, um, when they, they are brought together, when they're joined together. I mean, I don't know the right term right now, but it, you, the, the, the offspring is a mule. So a zo is the offspring. That's it. It's the offspring of a yak and an ox. So, but it's a, it's a strong animal. It's a strong animal. Um, and so we should not put the load that you would put on a zoo, it's a Tibetan or Himalayan animal, you shouldn't put it onto an ox because an ox is um, much weaker. So likewise here, it means do not uh, pa do not pass on the blame and the responsibility that is actually your own onto another. So in this case, if we were responsible for whatever we've done, well, we shouldn't load it off uh, we shouldn't offload our weaknesses. We shouldn't uh, place our shouldn't place blame on another person when it's actually our own fault. And again, do we do that or not? And I mean, like at work, come on, or when you're in the Dharma Center. I mean, when we work with other people, and we don't want them to know that it was our fault, and rather allow another person to be blamed, even if we don't blame the other person, but we're we allow everyone else to blame that person. No, to not do that. To not, uh, as it says, place the load of a zo on an ox. Oh, sorry. <laughs> you couldn't see that yet. Okay. So do not strike at the heart. That was to do with the emotions. And then do not place the load of a zo, of a zo onto an ox. Okay. So that's the next point. Um. And then it goes on to say, do not abuse this practice as a right. Okay, we don't really do rituals that much when we are into when we come into the Dharma. Uh, so this is probably not something that we need to look out for. But here what it's saying is that um, some of the Dharma practices, I mean, some of the the, the rituals that, that are done in, in like as part of prayer rituals, pujas and so forth, are done to deal with um, negative influences, for instance. But here, this kind of practice should not be used in that way, like some kind of shamanic ritual or like a, uh, to deal with harmful influences. No, it's only meant to, as an antidote to mental afflictions, and those are our own and ordinary thoughts. So not to subdue someone else or some other force. No, it's to subdue our own, our own, uh, afflictions, our own self-centeredness. So very important, though I don't think we have uh, that much of a problem with this, but some people like rituals, like rites, and they have their place, they have their meaning, but this particular practice is just for our own uh, mind training. Do not sprint to win a race. Um, it means two things. It means not to be ambitious in the sense of like competitive, oh, I want to, like, being competitive with others. But it also means not to rush what shouldn't be rushed. That doesn't mean we cannot have strong love and compassion for sentient beings and want to, as quickly as we can, benefit others. No, when it comes out of a, a wish to succeed, I want to be quickly done. I want to be, you know, when it comes out of self-centeredness, basically, to rush it. I want to do tantric practice because then I'll be a Buddha, but not for the benefit of others. It's really like just, I want this. I want to do this advanced practice. I want to rush into it. No, do not sprint to win a race. This is not a race. This is for the benefit of all sentient beings, including ourselves. But of course, we're just one of endless sentient beings. All right. So do not sprint to win a race. Do not turn the gods into demons. Okay, so what does it mean? 
uh, it's similar to what we discussed earlier. So when you hear about like the, the different gods in certain religions, so sometimes a god can uh, be displeased and and harm cause harm, and so then ordinary beings would say, "Oh, this god is like a demon now." And here, this is the analogy used, or so the example here is used again in the way of not using poisonous. It's like turn the gods into demons. It's similar to not eat poisonous food in the sense of we should make sure that our practice does not lead to more pride and arrogance. So pride and arrogance in particular here. So previously it, it focused more on self-centeredness to not allow our self-centeredness to come in. Here it's specifically saying this pride and arrogance. Because, yeah, I mean, definitely this is an issue when people become good at whatever practice they're doing. Let's not forget study of the Dharma, practice of the Dharma. They're all tools. And if someone has a tendency to be arrogant and and full of themselves, well, if they're good at their studies, that's going to happen. Arrogance and pride are going to take over. If they're good at doing long-term retreats, I don't know, three-year retreats, if they're not careful, they come out of this retreat and like, oh, I just did a three-year retreat, look at me. So I'm not saying that it's that obvious. It may just be something, some inner kind of, arrogance some inner kind of and to watch out for that am i really can i can i catch that kind of inner inner demon basically that's kind of i feel a little bit superior to others do i feel superior to this person this is really something to watch out for and a lot of people think they they're not and I mean, it's for me, of course, it's it's sometimes easier to recognize it in others. It's sometimes so interesting when people, and this is not to do with the Dharma, but when people come, for instance, to, to the nunnery where I live in, like foreigners sometimes, and their intentions are really great. I mean, they really have the intention to help, but they somehow feel the nuns don't do it right. They have a better solution. And... The the thing is, it, the, the other solution may be actually better, but it's not suitable. It doesn't suit the, 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 the custom. It doesn't suit the environment and so forth. And so sometimes this kind of, it's, it's like we know it better. So when I watched this, I was thinking, oh, that's kind of arrogance. But then I started looking at my own mind and I found exactly that. I thought I wasn't arrogant, but I am. I totally am. I have these thoughts. I know better. I do and so forth. So I, it was these other people. I, I noticed it in them, uh, which is always easier. But then I recognized, oh, my gosh, I've got so much. I've got so much of that, what I'm thinking. I'm a little better than this. I'm a little so I'm biased. And I'm thinking because of such and such, I'm full of myself. So really, and if it has to do with the Dharma, then I'm really turning gods into demons. So, so important to be careful with that, to not turn it around, to turn something so precious into a means to be arrogant and so forth. And of course, do not seek others' misery, others' misery as a means to happiness. Very important, very important. Um, we had this discussion, Leora, she asked me about being happy about another person's misery. Remember we had that discussion? Is that okay or not? It is only okay um, if I feel happy about another person maybe losing their position as, let's say, as a politician, because I, I, I have a deep sense they will stop harming themselves and others. This is good news. But not with this in German, we say Schadenfreude, this kind of being happy with another person now suffering. That is, that's terrible. And so, or that's terrible in a sense that is uh, definitely in opposition to mind training, to compassion, love, and so forth. And so, seeking another person's misery, if we want, if we do something, if we try to do something to find as a means to happiness but which if it means their misery if that's our intention then that's wrong if it makes them miserable but our intention was not for them to be miserable but to stop harming themselves and others then that's different but very important to check our intention 
right? I mean, I was on the news the other day. Great, well done. <laughs> All the demonstrations, by the way. <laughs> I, I, I saw it. I was like, maybe I see Gila, Leor, someone I knew. <laughs> was on the news. Anyway, but no, it's it's wonderful. All the, the but again, very important. Do not seek others' misery as a means to happiness. It was important to check our motivation. Okay. So I went through it a little bit quicker than I sometimes do, but it's not that difficult to understand. There are commentaries you can read. Um, there are explanations on this. Plenty of commentaries have been written on these seven points. If you still have any doubts, uh, you can always refer back to them. We've got these presets of mind training. These are left to do. There are 22. To, to be to go through and many of them are similar yeah very similar others are quite different so we'll go through them all of them but most important is that um, you allow these points to speak to your heart to see them as like personal instructions by the buddha by your lama as if your lama through this text, is speaking to you as you read the text and see it as a way to kind of check, oh, which one of those applies to me? Which one do I still need to work on? Or which one at this point in time? And in that way, once you recognize there's some work to be done, to then, of course, apply, apply it in whichever way we can. All right. So having said all this, let's then do some meditation on we start with the we start with the zo with the don't uh don't place the because this is where we got to i don't want to go through too much just a sec do not strike at the oh, yeah so point 14 from 14 to 18 let's meditate on that okay and as we always do we start with the mindfulness meditation, being mindful of the breath. All right. So Geshe Chekala tells us to not place the load of a zo, of a strong animal such as a zo, onto a weaker animal such as an ox. He's just basically saying, We shouldn't blame others for our problems. We shouldn't offload our weaknesses, our guilt, and our responsibility onto others. So are there situations where we actually blame others? Or maybe allow for them to be blamed without taking responsibility?
or the mistakes we've made. And then text says, do not abuse this practice as a rite or a ritual. So reading it like a prayer on a daily basis in the form of a ritual, but without actually putting it into practice. Which can also be said to other prayers, which can be said about other prayers we may do on a daily basis, which have become like a ritual without allowing them to transform our mind, without reflecting on them. And internalizing their meaning. So do not sprint to win a race. So we shouldn't rush into things. We should engage in practices that are appropriate. Take our time. Even if it means a lot of repetition. and not compete with others. We shouldn't mistake the true ambition and aspiration. We shouldn't confuse aspiration and ambition.
Also, Keshe Chagawa tells us not to turn gods into demons. Which means that we shouldn't allow our practice of mind training to lead to more pride and arrogance. The three activities of study, reflection, and meditation are important tools that help us to train and transform our mind. are tools to subdue our mind. But if instead become puffed up with pride and arrogance, We've turned the gods into demons. And then the text tells us to not seek others' misery as a means to happiness. Of course, we may have to stop someone from harming themselves and others. But we should never do so. By wishing for their misery. wishing for them to suffer and be unhappy. But instead, do whatever we do 
based on putting ourselves under the other person's shoes and act out of empathy, affection and compassion. So let's then conclude this analysis by taking you a few moments to single-pointedly focus on whatever conclusion, whatever insight we've come to. In order for that insight to sink deeper and affect us on an emotional level. And thereby affect our daily activities of body, speech and mind. And then let's dedicate whatever positive potential we accumulated together. Let's, of course, dedicate it towards our own enlightenment, towards actualizing our fullest potentials so that we're able to help others to actualize their fullest potential. And in the meantime, May it cause our spiritual masters, our lamas, like His Holiness the Dalai Lama and all other great masters, to have long and healthy lives, to be able to continue to teach us through their examples and their teachings. And may, of course, this positive potential affect all other sentient beings right now. And may it help for principles of democracy to remain strong and unhindered from any kind of autocratic tendencies. So with this in mind, let's recite the dedication prayers. Through the merits of these virtuous actions, may I quickly attain the state of Raguru Buddha and lead all living beings without exception into that enlightened state. In the land encircled by snow mountains, you are the source of all happiness and good. All powerful, generous, Denzen Gyatso, please remain until samsara ends. May the precious Bodhi mind not yet born arise and grow. May that born have no decline, but increase forevermore. Okay, thank you very much. Um, so we'll have another class, still not done with the, well, still need to go through the presentation of the precepts of mind training, so we'll do that.
next time, get as far as we get. And well, I'll, as soon as I've done with the entire text, we'll start the um, precious garland. Now, as I said, I'm following those three books. I'm going to get them myself. If you want to get them, you're welcome to, but I'm just going to show them on the screen anyway. I think that's okay in terms of um, copyrights, etc. So we can compare them and in that way discuss them, uh, reflect on them and meditate on them. And if you have any suggestions, you're welcome to voice them to send a message to the lead about the topic. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you Bye. Bye. Take care. Thank you, Dalit. Bye.